really excited to uh, introduce uh, a, uh, a the, the team from um, Lehigh Valley. Uh, we've been uh, working with uh, them along with uh, Nuket and her team here for for the last year. So um, it's a uh, certainly I think the most sophisticated simulation built of any kind built in this platform. Um, and uh, I think it's I a very interesting part. example that we're going to see here uh, that goes well beyond just the medical field. Uh, it's really an example of uh, how to facilitate and rehearse teamwork and leadership effectively in a multiplayer environment. Uh, so with that, I'd like to uh, uh, turn it over to uh, Alex uh, uh, Lem uh, Lemney from Lehigh Valley Health Network and his uh, able team here who are going to take us through this uh, sim emergency response simulation. And thanks so much, AJ. Sure. Um, welcome, everyone. I'm hoping you can hear me all right. Um, so uh, welcome to our environment. And uh, I'd like to, of course, recognize the uh, Gronsted Group and 3D Virtual Crafting, who have been awesome partners to work on. Um, they've helped us through some of the more sophisticated animation, custom animation work um, and customizing our Avaya uh, level that we've been playing with. So um, if you want to join me and just, I have a few slides that I'll put up to um, do an introduction, brief you on the project, and then the, my team and I are going to actually let you observe a simulation that we're going to run for you, uh, and then we can talk about it at the end. Uh, I would remind you, if you would, be sure you're muted. And if you have any text questions that you want to put up, when you use chat, if you would use the global feature, that way um, I'll be able to see those questions. It gets a little confusing when everyone uses proximity or um, the individual. So if you would, follow me over this way. Bit. W shift here, you can run. So just uh, steer with uh, with the mouse and hit W on the keyboard to walk. You can hit W shift to run. If you want to come okay. over this way. Okay, Hello. great. You would follow me. It's a W to walk. Hey, I think I heard Nuket's voice. Hi, Nuket. Welcome. Hi, Alex. You're virtual. Yeah. Um, this is great. Would you like to follow um, me? Yeah. Thanks for joining us. So um, I'm going to introduce my team who's with me um, and who have been collaborating with me as we've been developing. So Jason Payton is with me somewhere out there in the crowd. Jason, if you jump up or wave. Oh, okay, there you are. Um, Jason's been our um, an instructional designer and our 3D developer for our world. By the way, our what we've been playing with, it's been a very small project team of five of us. Um, Jason, myself, Valerie Rupp, who's our simulation center um, manager and also an advanced practice clinician um, and part of our clinical faculty team. And then there's two other people who aren't present today because of schedule conflicts. Um, Dr. Bill Bond, who's our medical director and physician faculty, head of our simulation activities, and Mary Susco, one of our clinical faculties, a nurse educator, and works with our practice sites. So um, just, just to help you understand, we're a large health network in the state of Pennsylvania, and part of the problem that I've been trying to address with, with using virtual reality is we've got close to 180 practice sites, these are medical offices, like your, your general practice physician that you see, that are scattered in a 60 mile radius of our, our main hospital campus. So we've been trying to figure out a way that we can bring immersive, um, highly engaging, high value training activities to those offices to eliminate the need for our faculty to travel, our students to come on site, or to interrupt their busy schedules. They, they have very time constrained schedules with patient flow. So that's the pretty much the goal of this. 
my whole department called the Division of Education, where the training function within the hospital, we are separate from our human resources. My group focuses really on the clinical education and development of our physicians, nurses, and then all of the medical students, nursing students, and other um, allied health professionals that we see in the network. Altogether, my department has about 55,000 student contacts a year. So it's a, a fairly high volume um, group. Um, so we started, and probably like, I, I recognize a lot of the names of people who were appearing here. Um, we started playing back in Second Life um, a number of years ago. And we did a couple prototype projects that were really well um, accepted by our faculty and students. Uh, we did a um, ST elevated MI, uh, pardon me, we did a basically what would be known as a heart attack situation. Um, a woman came into the hospital for an admission and she began dis, uh, displaying signs and symptoms of, um, of a, a medical emergency. And the whole activity was around rapid response. So it really gave us a sense that the VR really was um, going to be useful for I'm going to have to bounce because that presentation is starting now. And I, so I want to make sure I get there. If you guys want. Could you mute him? Yes. Yeah, um, so <clears throat> part of what we're, we're really intrigued with was the idea of studying team behavior under emergency situations and helping our clinicians feel comfortable um, practicing their clinical skills. We left Second Life and came here to Avaya for a couple reasons. The ability of the platform, at least Second Life a number of years ago, um, we found it very unstable to work with. We found it crashing a lot on us. The client software was awkward on our corporate PCs. User interface was way more complex than this, and we found our faculty and our students had a very hard time navigating and being distracted by the Second Life interface. Um, we love this because, of course, there's no client app at all. It's purely um, web-based with a plug-in. <clears throat> we've been playing with, and these are interactive um, emergencies that we built for a team of people to do together. So we're not talking about an asynchronous event, but rather one in which um, a group of learners comes together with faculty to, it, to reenact a, a scenario and then to debrief or discuss it. So in this current project, we've created three emergency scenarios um, based around a heart attack or a chest pain scenario, a seizure. Uh, um, I'm sorry, that's not right. We changed that. Respiratory emergency and then a behavioral health um, and the one we're going to demo for you today, we're going to walk through is a respiratory, an anaphylactic reaction. Um, and then you can watch us interact and then you can hear us talk or debrief at the end about it. Uh, the other objective was our family practices rolled out a new emergency cart, which you're going to see featured in this. That emergency cart for us is a standard piece of equipment and familiarizing our clinicians with how the cart physically looks, but then what drugs and equipment are found on the cart was important to us. Believe it or not, not all of our offices, and this is pretty common across the country, not all medical offices are equipped with emergency carts or um, crash carts, or they have a varied, various names they might use. So for our network, um, this is pretty leading for the state of Pennsylvania to be rolling out standardized uh, carts. So at this point, if you all would join me, we're going to walk into the facility, and I'm going to take you all up to the observation deck. So if you follow me, it's best to use the external entrance to that area, unless we actually want to walk in the stuff. Yeah, good that way. We're talking about back here. So if you're going to follow me, if we're going to go in the back door and up the steps to our left. So if you all go up the steps to your left and make your way up to the roof. And I or can't find my avatar. 
And Jason, could I ask you to hang out for a little while to guide more people up? Go ahead. Thanks. Welcome. Come on in. It's been so long and, since and I did an avatar thing. I don't know how to do this. Hi, Holly. Would you like to follow me? It's with W you can walk. For those of you who went past me, if you turn around. And oh, it's just been so long since I did this. I don't know how to do this. Right, for those of you who went just past me. With the, if you hold the W key down, you will walk where you look. So where is you would my like avatar? To, <laughs> I <laughs> can. <laughs> I can. Yeah. Okay. That's good, Holly. Oh, that's my play. avatar. I'm a guy. Yes. Yes, oh, you are that's a guy. Great. It is assigned <laughs> randomly. <laughs> you can customize your avatar later on. All right. Welcome, everyone. You know, kind of. Am I going the right place? I suppose. I suppose one okay. of the things I should mention, we're talking about gender identity, is. We have really found it very interesting to also explore team role and team membership identity in the, uh, through the use of avatars. And what I mean by that is we've had participants like physicians take nurse roles and we've had nurses take physician roles. So welcome everyone up here to what we call the observation deck. Um, kind of looks like a big rat maze. Um, this allows us, our faculty, to observe the participants without um, impeding the activity. So after this is done, I'll invite you to all go downstairs and wander around. But what you'll see is from downstairs looking up, you just see a ceiling tile with fluorescent light fixtures. From up here looking down, it's obviously transparent. And if you all gather over here around this exam room, you look where I'm standing to the front right for most of you. You'll see me jumping up and down. So this is where you could gather. And Anders, could I ask you for a favor? Sure. Would you mind hanging out over here and guiding people over to gather? Because I'm going to be part of the, um, the activity and I'm going to go downstairs. Okay, right. So Anders will help get you all sorted. So we're still going to hear Alex from down there. You will, Anders. As Alex explained, this is kind of a one-way mirror, so they're not seeing us from down there. <laughs> they're just seeing a regular uh, ceiling and lights, no. lights, pictures. If, if I look up at you guys, all I see is a white ceiling with fluorescent lights. Um, so you guys should be seeing the four of us down here. And at this point, I'm actually going to introduce um, Valerie Rupp, our um, advanced practice clinician and nurse fac uh, clinical faculty. And um, she's going to take lead from here. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me OK? Yeah, we hear you great. OK, great. So I'm going to set the stage for you. And I'm going to have each of us wave when, I, um, when we identify ourselves so you know which role we'll be playing. So Jason is going to play the role of the medical assistant. Jason, can you give a wave there? Hello. Um, AJ will play the role of the nurse. I did. Um, Shannon will play the role of the patient, who is Lisa Thornberry. Um, and I will play the role of the nurse practitioner. <clears throat> and so this is a brief scenario about the case. Lisa Thornberry is a 42-year-old female with an allergy to erythromycin, and she was seen earlier at the office for an upper respiratory infection. At that time, she was prescribed erythrom azithromycin, excuse me, which is an antibiotic that is similar to the one that she's allergic to. She left the office and filled her prescription and took a dose of the antibiotic. At that time, she began with a rash and itching. She's now returned to the primary care physician's office because she's having difficulty breathing. She's been brought to the exam room, and the practitioner has been summoned to see the patient as soon as possible due to her difficulty breathing. So 
So, hi, Lisa. Uh, my name's AJ. I'm one of the nurses here at the practice office. How are you doing? I'm okay. You sound a bit out of breath, Lisa. What's going on? I heard that you're, um, you were just in to see us earlier today. But now I can't breathe and I'm really itchy. Okay. How long ago did you take it? Um, I don't know, a few hours. Okay. Val, I just got her. Her blood pressure is 102 over 60. Hi, Lisa. I'm Valerie. I'm the nurse practitioner that will be taking care of you today. I heard what you had to say here to our nurse, and I understand you were seen here earlier. You were given an antibiotic, and you, you had that prescription filled um, and did take one of those before coming in. Is that correct? Yes. And since that time, you've been having some difficulty breathing? Yeah. Val, her O2 is um, down to 88%. Okay. Nurse, could you please um, apply some oxygen to Ms. Thornberry here? Could you place a non-rebreather of six liters? Lisa, I'm going to take a listen to your lungs. You're really struggling. Yeah. Nurse, could you please give Lisa some medication? I'd like epinephrine, 0 0.3 milligrams sub-Q. And afterwards, medication. that will help you um, with which will help ease your breathing. Okay. Valerie, the epinephrine has been administered three milligrams. Lisa, I believe that you're having a reaction to the antibiotic that you took. I'm going to actually transport you over the hot to the hospital so that we can continue to observe you. Okay. Val, the diphenhydramine, 50 milligrams has been administered. Jason, could you do us a favor and pull up her medical record? Sure. And Jason, when you're done, could you please call 911 so we can transport this patient over to the hospital? Lisa, the medications will take a few minutes to work. Are you feeling any relief? I am. I'm feeling a little better. It's easier now to breathe. Great. Uh, 911 has been called, and her patient record is up on the computer. Anything notable? Lisa, I know that you, uh, I've noted that you have a history of um, exercise-induced asthma, as well as the allergies to peanuts and the erythromycin. Uh -huh. I would suggest from this point forward that you, know, that you no longer take any myosin drugs, and we'll note it in your medical record that um, you're allergic to the erythromycin as well as the azithromycin. Val, her blood pressure's up a little bit. She's at 110 over 70. And her pulse is up to, Lisa, you're probably feeling the effects of the epinephrine. Your pulse is up to 130. Um, her O2 is nicely up, 96. And Lisa, how are you feeling? Better. Great. I'm going to take a listen to your lungs here, okay? Okay. Great. Things are sounding much better. The ambulance should be here any moment, and we can transport you to the hospital. All right. For everyone's benefit, I'm going to interrupt. We're going to pause here. We've skipped two pieces. We've skipped the introduction. We had Lisa already back here in the room. And we're also going to skip the end of this where the medic, the EMS person, would arrive on scene and take Lisa out of here on a stretcher. So what normally would happen at this point is Valerie, as our clinical faculty, about the learning and reinforce some of the education that they learned during the scenario. We would talk about what went well and what could have been done better. Um, we would discuss what they learned and how they would take this in, and apply it into practice. Additionally, we would talk about the virtual reality, reality environment, discuss the technology, um, how they liked the world, what was easy to learn, um, what were some of the barriers that they encountered by um, uh, using this world. So some of the things you didn't get to see because they're unique to the participant interacting with the different tools and devices, for example, is when Jason, as our medical assistant, accessed the patient record. Um, and you guys can go explore when we're done here, but Jason clicked on the computer terminal in the room and it brought up an image of our basically our internal menu system and he was able to access the patient's medical record. And that's typical. Um, and he would verbally report to the provider and to the nurse what findings were there or notables from the patient record. In our other uh, chest pain scenario, 
um, there is an electrocardiogram that the physician interacts with, and the physician sees that displayed on his screen. Not all participants would see it simultaneously. So the idea there was that communications across the team are important to be verbalized, what we call a closed loop protocol. And that is, in other words, Valerie ordered a drug to be administered. I acknowledged that order, and then I repeated that the, the administration was completed. Hopefully, some of you noticed above the bed, and I'm going to do it again, I'm going to administer another uh, medication. If you look above the patient's exam table, a red sign appeared, dextrose gel was just administered. Completely wrong drug, by the way, for this uh, scene, but I just wanted you to see the message. That was the visual confirmation, and then we also implemented this scoreboard, this white checklist that's on the wall here, and you'll notice blue check marks start appearing. This was a way then for the team for two purposes. One, that during the activity they could look up as a visual reminder. Um, so a little bit of kind of uh, managing cognitive load for the participants. Our people aren't that adept at playing in virtual worlds, and we found it a little overwhelming for them to keep all their clinical knowledge in active memory and interact in the world. So we added this one device as a means of mediating that. So it's just a simple checklist that's triggered when people click on different actions and they can see what drugs are administered. The second purpose is that um, at the debriefing point, the clinician can, of course, look up at that and say, well, you guys, you, you administered epinephrine, but you skipped the diphenhydramine, which is basically Benadryl. Um, and they can get into a discussion as to why they decided that. Clearly, if you zoom in closely on our patient, you can look at her and you'll see that um, physically she's just animations in Gronstead group, um, but you also notice that her skin is blotchy. It was important that visually hives or urticaria um, is present, um, demonstrating a physical symptom of anaphylaxis. And then, of course, and Shannon, could you switch to the gasping animation for us? Of course, we wanted to visually dramatize that the patient is in distress. And it's interesting that in our activities that we've done so far with this, not only is the patient now visibly in distress, so we can see that she's gasping, she's heaving, her body's moving forward, having difficulty breathing, but our participants' level of anxiety starts to go up. So what our participants have reported to it is that, yes, in fact, the visualizations were very important to engaging them that in fact they started to feel anxious. As a matter of fact, some of our participants were frustrated with, the, the, with their, their lack of familiarity with the 3D interface to be able to respond quicker than they wanted to, um, which we just took as part of the learning curve. The point for us was from a design perspective that being able to, to recreate such a simple but um, key visual symptom of anaphylaxis was important. So for us, in summary, a couple of our findings, and by the way, I left some slides out there. You can go out back and, and look at my slides, but really there were four things that I wanted to emphasize or share with you that we found. I mean, there's a whole host of them. I know a lot of you, I recognize your name, so I know you've been developing in virtual worlds yourselves and experimenting. But for us, we did find that real, realism isn't just about the visualizations. It's not just the visual um, accuracy with which you recreate something. It's also the authenticity of the scenario itself. In our case, it needed to be believable for our clinicians. And there's certain things that are expected, which implies a sequence, a logical sequence to things. So when I administer epinephrine, I expect to see a change in the blood pressure and heart rate of my patient. So keeping that authenticity was important for us. The other thing was brief. You noticed our whole situation, the simulation ran in five minutes. It was important for our cases to be very concise for our participants so that they could get in, have an exercise, an activity debrief, and return to their job. So we're trying to keep our cases as micro lessons, roughly a 30-minute encounter. The other thing was use of a patient actor instead of a bot. 
We have looked at a number of bots or AI software out there, and really it's cool technology, but it's still immature from our perspective and unstable and unpredictable. We um, just decided it's a lot easier. The range of interaction that a standardized patient actor can provide or a patient actor is, um, is worth it to us, and that's what we're using. And then finally, um, of the level of, of detail, you'll like a recreation of a specific medical office who's been training in it. So that, in terms of the general layout, was important to them. But a lot of the clutter, desk clutter, um, stuff from the countertops, jars, is all missing. So we played with how much detail to you build into the world. And we found that if you go on the far end of, of realism and detail to it, it actually becomes distracting to the point that the participants begin to look for errors in the world, or they begin to, you begin to set the wrong expectation with your users that they, in fact, will find all clinical tools regardless of their relevance. So we backed off on detail um, just, to be, just to be what's exactly needed for a particular case. So Valerie, could you add some comments from the perspective of faculty and what you've seen? Um, well, from my perspective, perspective, I'm not a gamer and I have little experience with video games. So when you first invited me to the team, AJ, I have to say I was a little reluctant. But I have found my experience working on this project to be very positive. Um, I found the technology to be very user-friendly, um, and I found the tool to be very educational. I was a little concerned when I first entered it that it may feel a little silly or maybe a little game-like, but what I actually found was that the environment was so rich um, that it was very believable for me. So I found myself really getting engaged um, with this scenario and feeling some of the same things that I feel when I'm in a real emergent situation um, when I'm working clinically. So to me, I needed that buy-in piece um, in order for me to learn from a product like this. Um, I have found this to be very fun and engaging at the same time, although taking this all very seriously. Um, and as you had um, said in the beginning when you made the introductions, AJ, that I am the manager of the Human Simulation Center here. And um, unlike human simulation, when most times the learners have to travel to us at our center for education, this tool provides us the ability to take the education to different locations. So it's more of a mobile education, if you will. Great. Um, Jason, what about from the technical perspective? You've had some good observations. Uh, so uh, we've been developing on this platform for a little over a year, and it's certainly been uh, you know, a learning experience because we were sort of uh, developing the content as we were also learning how to use the platform. Uh, prior to uh, jumping onto the Avaya Live platform, we had been using Second Life. Um, but, uh, in going to this platform, we had to learn things like 3D modeling, so uh, Autodesk Maya, uh, and using like Photoshop and Illustrator to create some of the textures, um, and then also learning how to use the Unreal 2.5 uh, development environment to you know, bring it all together. Um, so as AJ mentioned, uh, the environment that we've created here is actually one of our uh, physical practices. Um, and so we basically started by uh, going over to that physical location and gathering resources uh, through uh, photographs and video. Um, and the first thing that we did is uh, try to recreate the actual layout. So we matched like the floor plan, try to match the te texture. And then we also tried to match the equipment that they would find in each room. But like AJ said, uh, tried not to add any extra clutter. Um, uh, overall, uh, with the three scenarios that we put together, we try to use uh, an iterative design approach, uh, iterative design and development approach, where we basically put together our first scenario, which was a cardiac emergency, um, and then we, you know, developed that scenario. We went out and we tested it with our participants, and then we took their comments and uh, went back and changed certain things, uh, made some updates, and then basically carried those uh, suggestions through to the next design. Um, and we've basically noticed that as we go forward, they have less and less things that they're requesting. So, Jason, do you want to uh, tell the group about how you uh, actually videotaped a uh, live action dramatization of the scenario? Because that proved to be, I think, uh, a very effective way to develop the scenario. Oh, certainly. Uh, so basically what we ended up doing is running through a mock uh, scenario uh, of the 
you know, of our design uh, and recording it for ourselves so that we could sort of pick out um, maybe some things that we need to do differently. Uh, any, uh, any input on that, AJ? Yeah, um, it, it really actually uh, was a great tool for us because one of the things you'll notice is, so Valerie just introduced herself. She's a clinician by practice um, and an educator. She has no familiarity with 3D technologies and um, curriculum design like that. And I have to admit, I didn't either. I mean, a lot of us come from 2D curriculum design backgrounds. And our team was very interdisciplinary. So what I found happening is our two clinicians would defer to Jason and I, assuming we're the tech guys, for the technical decisions. And Jason and I were deferring to Valerie and Bill as, of course, the experts with medical knowledge. And what was happening really wasn't at a true collaboration level until we decided to script our lesson plan and the four of us actually dressed the parts and we videotaped ourselves reenacting, role-playing the, um, the entire scenario. So Bill played the provider, Valerie played the nurse, Jason played our medic. We had another person, um, Shannon, um, who played our patient. I played um, a medical assistant, I think. And we videotaped ourselves and it gave us, it, it drew us all into the medical content and it all gave us a greater appreciation for each other's part and a lot more, um, what's the word? It empowered us to talk about and cross boundaries. It gave Jason and I the courage to talk about and question medically the process and flow. And it empowered Val and Bill to question technically why we would design something a certain way. So that video became really powerful. And then, of course, we were collaborating with Anders and Nuquette's teams. So I get on the phone with them and I say, oh, we need a blood pressure animation. And they're like, what do you mean? What does that look like? So for us to be able to pass them the video solved that problem. They were actually able to see what a patient's behavior looked like for the animations we wanted. We sent some digital images for skin um, anomalies like the urticaria. Uh, so yeah, it, was, it really turned out to be a, a, a very powerful tool and kind of an obvious and simple one, to be honest, in hindsight um, for us. Yeah, it was brilliant. We, uh, and then we took screenshots from the video and created the storyboard uh, from the video, uh, but really helped us understand better uh, and created a common points of references. Yeah, it's, uh, hey, Alex and Tim, it's a little hard for us standing up here to really see the, uh, the, um, the details of the simulation and the icons. So maybe you could describe the, the icons on top of the patient avatars and on the cart there and how that works, how you click on the, these icons to get the readings. Perhaps you could just sure. walk us through that a bit. Perhaps yeah, you guys are hanging up on the there. observation deck. You're welcome to start wandering around. I have our, our voice set on shout for the whole environment, so you'll hear us no matter where you go. Um, so when you um, come into one of the patient settings, Right now in the room, we're in exam room 10, and um, Lisa's sitting on the exam table. There's some icons that are hovering over her. We tried to create an analog for um, auscultation or listening to body sounds. Um, the word is auscultation. So it's when you go to the doctor and they take a stethoscope and they listen to your heart and lungs or your, your tummy. Um, that's called auscultation. And of course, we needed a, an analog for that action. And our way of dealing with it was by creating those icons that are hovering above the patient, um, the heart icon. And I can tell you, you probably won't hear the heart sounds. There's too much ambient noise with me talking right now. Um, probably the lung sounds will be a little better, but still faint to hear. But in a small team of four, when they're actually playing, you can click on those. Now, in this case, the heart sounds are normal. But if you're a trained clinician, you're going to identify, is it called wheezing or yeah. crackles? Wheezing. Wheezing. In this case, would be wheezing. In this case you're, going to, you're going to hear um, wheezing or what's referred to as strider. In our chest pain scenario, the lung sounds are clear. Um, and believe it or not, the heart rhythm is normal. Uh, the heart sound is normal. But when the clinician does the EKG, the... Um, 
the image of the heart will display with an abnormality in the rhythm um, that will warrant a uh, transport to acute care. The other icons are how they interact with objects. So the blood pressure cuff icon is what actually puts the blood pressure cuff on the patient. And then a secondary icon is what's used to trigger an actual blood pressure reading. Above the O2 cylinder in the medication box are also interactive icons where you can access the submenus to administer drugs or oxygen. It was our approach, and it's interesting going into other environments and seeing how people do things. It seems like we all kind of figure it out in the end, something relatively close um, to this. Probably one of the, the, and there's a lot of cool environments out there right now, but one of the really neat ones, I'll um, put a plug in for um, uh, Pavarti Dev and her team's work with ClinySpace. Um, they've done some really cool stuff and are, are really years ahead of us um, with kind of thinking through how do you create these 3D environment analogs of clinical action. Um, and trying to come up with that, you know, isn't always easy. It takes some trial and error um, to come up with something that's intuitive. And, you know, I don't want to get, like, too out there, but a lot of you are educators and you can appreciate the cognitive processes that go on. So when you actually try to create an analog of a psychomotor-based skill, someone doing something clinically that's skill-based, you want to create the representation in their mind so that it becomes a meaningful metaphor, so that the person's act of clicking on the EKG and seeing the rhythm being displayed basically implies cognitively all of those steps that they would have had to go through, such as the 12 lead connections, that's hooking up all the wires correctly to the body, entering their body weight, age, gender, um, some relevant physiological information so that the machine calibrates before it begins to run the strip. So coming up with analogs that implies all of those steps that a clinician goes through is what I'm talking about, takes some thoughtful and very intentional design. Well, please feel free to wander around. Um, and, you know, if you, um, I think I have it set up. If you look at my avatar, my email address will appear. Um, you are welcome to email me questions. A couple people asked me if there is a um, something written up on this project. Yes, um, unfortunately, it's behind our firewall, so I can't give you our URL. But I'm glad to share a project document with you. With you. Um, my email, I'll um, type it out for you guys. You're welcome to email me um, comments or questions, um, and I'd be glad to share. And, you know, Anders, thank you for this um, and for your work, Nuket and you too, but for hosting these, Anders, um, this has been a great community to be part of. Thank you very much. This has been great. I think we're actually close to capacity here of the space, so we've got a great crowd. Um, so you've got um, uh, three simulations going on currently in three different observation rooms here for three different scenarios. And do you, do you want to say something about how the feedback from the participants, doctors and nurses, medical uh, assistants? Yeah, they They've been very um, positive. Somebody, by the way, just asked the question about how many participants have been trained. Um, so far, we've had about 25 people through this, through these three scenarios. Um, this is uh, actually a demonstration project for us. Um, and we're now talking with um, our emergency department and our physicians group to roll this out as a tool for training new urgent care center staff 
and then also for our other practices. So the target audience for this is about, uh, what is it, about 500? Yeah. About 500. The other uh, group that we're talking to is our information services department. Our network is on the verge of implementing a new electronic medical health record. Uh, for, for those of you in other industry segments, this is like an ERP, an enterprise resource planning system implementation, or replacing your inventory control system. This is one of our, this is our core system to how we operate. So it's a pretty big deal. We're looking at um, creating virtual simulations that can situate the use of the new electronic medical record in delivering of patient care. Um, and then we're also um, looking at a um, doing leadership uh, simulations was a new idea that just came up. Uh, and that was using the VR environment to do um, conflict and what we call crucial conversation encounters. But feedback has been incredibly positive. Our, our clinicians enjoy the playful nature of it. Um, one of the things we certainly considered was the novelty effect. Will it wear off? Um, and we've tried to um, judge that by the fact we've had um, multiple uh, p participants who have done multiple game plays and continue to report high level of satisfaction um, and enjoyment. In particular, they like the camaraderie of training as a team. Um, lots of laughter. Uh, usually uh, we get a lot of good fun. Um, and we found that the debriefings become very animated. People become fairly free to share uh, comments. And for us, that's important because when you look at an interdisciplinary team, you're dealing with hierarchical issues. You've got a physician very high in the hierarchy. And then you have what are like nurses, aides, or medical assistants, which are very entry level in the hierarchy. And we have found a lot more freedom for crosstalk as a result. So, of course, uh, the medical field is pretty unique compared to a lot of other corporate fields that many of you are probably working with in that you guys already do a lot of live simulations. Uh, and I uh, had the great fortune to, to see your, uh, your live um, simulation uh, uh, department uh, this fall, which is really an entire hospital wing where actors come in and put on makeup and stuff and their mannequins. Um, so, do you, do you want to address how, how, how do you th see this playing in with those type of live simulations? Do you s see this as replacing some of it, uh, complementing it, or? Um, sure. So, <clears throat> actually, we just had a, a, a pretty recent example of that. So, um, last month, we did a... So we had about 100 of our IS department, um, which is about 300 staffers. Um, so about a third of them came. And uh, what we did is we took four of them. So this is IS people, non-clinicians, untrained folk, um, as far as medicine, practice of medicine goes. And we ran, uh, did we do this one, respiratory? Yeah, we did this respiratory scenario with them. So we took four untrained uh, people and put them into the role of provider, nurse, medical assistant, and clerical staff. And we had them go through the virtual reality as a rehearsal. Then we took them back to our sim center, what Anders was describing. This is a physical recreation of a wing of our hospital where we've got about 16 patient rooms. And um, so we had a patient sitting back there, just like Lisa's sitting here, who was done up with moulage makeup to have rashes and bumps um, and gasping and out of breath, and she was briefed on the case. And those four went back and encountered that patient for the first time. And you know what? Oh, and by the way, this was all filmed live and televised to the other 96 of their closest friends who got to watch them. Um, and they did really well. So, I mean, one of the things that we kind of um, – we didn't plan it this way, but in hindsight, we were like, whoa, this really worked as a, a way to rehearse skill. I mean, here we took four people unfamiliar with anaphylaxis and, in, and dealing with it, um, and they were able to work through the case. 
Do you want to add some comments, Valerie? Because you've done. Uh, yeah, the only thing that I would add is that it was pretty amazing how they were able to work through a case in such a short period of time. So I think the amount of time that we spent in the virtual world was, what would you say, AJ, maybe 15 minutes at the yep. very most? And then they, they, and again, like AJ alluded to, that these are non-clinicians. So in that 15-minute time period, they learned enough about an emergent situation that they were able to take some of that learning and apply it in the real world. So I have to say that was very impressive. So Anders, one of, to answer your question, so what we are thinking in terms of positioning this is obviously um, a way to introduce more complex cases um, before they enter the simulation lab and do the activity. So we're actually looking at blending it with our mannequin-based simulation curriculum. Where this will be primarily to prepare them for the uh, the live simulations, then. Yes, exactly. Exactly. You, you um, can I also see, see this for ongoing rehearsals, right? To have more frequent um, rehearsals. Um. Well, that's the that's the idea behind this uh, original um, scenario this, that we've created. These office-based emergencies. Um, uh, so what I should share with the, the team is so office-based emergencies are one of the things that we call low-volume, high-risk, problem-prone. It's a, a key phrase for us in healthcare. Low-volume, high-risk, problem-prone. So it happens very infrequently. When it does happen, emotions tend to run high and mistakes occur, and they can have fatal results. So that's where you get the problem-prone and high stakes or high risk. So in the medical office, people don't have heart attacks. People don't fall over all the time and go into respiratory distress, or people don't fall over, with, thank goodness, with any frequency of, um, of, of these kind of things. Thus, even though you've got medical staff who are very highly trained, they just don't get to encounter these that often, so their skills get rusty. It's like training for CPR. Um, you don't get to use it very often, but boy, when you need it, you can't screw it up because somebody's life is at stake. So what we're doing is creating these um, emergency situations with the idea of providing um, practice, more frequent practice. The other thing that we're blending in here is what's called a standardized patient encounter. So part of the project that we're working on, besides doing this virtual reality-based, it's all going to climax with a patient actor actually coming on site to the medical office into their lobby and the patient is going to, the actor is going to walk up to the front desk and actually say, I'm having chest pain. Oh my God, it feels like somebody's sitting on my chest. And the staff need to react. Of course, we do that in a supervised setting. We also have to alert other patients in the lobby at the time that occurs because it can be very uh, stressful for uh, visitors. Um, so that they know what's going on, that it's a reenactment. But that really creates a very high stakes, and by the way, that can become a very high cost um, sim uh, situation to run. So our idea is to do um, less expensive 3D VR-based encounters as a way to rehearse and practice, and then as a way to assess competency, go on and do a, a one-time or a periodic um, high stakes standardized patient encounter to actually get them to demonstrate their skill and then um, assess for it. By the way, John, um, I, somebody asked the question, what's next? Um, he noted that I'm, we're considering migrating to another platform. Uh, we are. Um, interestingly, and by the way, Avaya has been an awesome platform to work on. It's been very stable. It's a wonderful hosted service. Um, which, which is my preference, is to have a hosted platform. I don't personally want to be an IS person. I'm a, an educator. Um, but one of the things that Avaya did about um, two or three months once we were into using it is they released an upgrade, which was really great. They did what a good vendor does. They upgraded their environment, but it included a feature that became a security risk for our data security department. They implemented desktop sharing. And unfortunately, there's no secure way of um, deactivating the feature. And that's um, changed the status of this product. Um, and it's now blocked by our, our corporate firewall as a result. It's a bummer. We really like it. 
So our choices are that we can get a version of Avaya Engage and install it behind our firewall. That is an option we're considering. Another option is that we're looking at other um, tools. We're looking at Unity. Um, we also are attracted to Unity like so many other people because it's multi-platform, so it will broaden um, accessibility. And then we're looking, I mentioned earlier, at a, um, a, a more unique niche um, product and service, and that's the ClinySpace uh, environment um, that comes pre-configured in a medical scenario um, with a fairly um, a sophisticated patient physiology simulator built in as part of it. Um, so, you know, it becomes the question of do I personally want to build it, own it, and take on the cost of maintenance and ownership? Um, and I'd personally rather license it and um, just focus on content. Um, I see someone asked a question, um, how long from design to beta version did it take to develop? It's a difficult question because of our learning curve was built into that. But from, uh, and by the way, my team, remember I said there's five of us working on this. Only Jason is full-time on this project. The rest of us are part-time. Um, as a matter of fact, very part-time. We're squeezing this in. <clears throat> so... Um, understanding our constrained resources. So we're talking one full-time instructional designer um, and uh, the rest of us being part-time. Um, we probably have, uh, I don't know, I haven't really kept track. I'm going to say around 500 person hours tied into it. The original lesson plan to the first uh, dry run prototype probably was stretched over about three months. If we were able to do it as a dedicated project, I'm betting we're at the point where we would turn around a new scenario in a week. Yeah, it's like with anything, the first time is always the, the hardest. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Alan, I saw your comment about um, OpenSim. Jason and I were just talking about OpenSim. So we are, um, we are going to take a closer look at it also since we're um, considering putting something behind our firewall. Oh, oh Oculus Rift. Close Rift. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, thanks to Anders. He dangled that toy in front of us and got us all excited. Um, so, uh, yeah, of course, we're, we're interested. Um, one of the things uh, about three years ago we started looking at was when uh, Microsoft Connect came out, Jason and one of our other developers um, got into hacking it, and that we actually, uh, they, I should say, Jason created an interface using the Connect to control Second Life environment. So we were very much taken with the gesture-based uh, computing and the idea of having a large screen projector, having multiple um, players interacting um, and in a physical uh, way as well. Um, we haven't gone much further with it other than proof of concept. Um, Oculus Rift, of course, switches that and offers something that's very immersive in terms of um, you know, completely controlling the visual field and immersing the player that way. So um, we're keeping our eye on it. We did look at um, 3D. Um, uh, I looked at the NVIDIA product for uh, 3D um, as something else to consider. Yeah, the Oculus, someone was asking, um, Unit is typically the program of choice to use. And for those of you that haven't seen it, we had a uh, a trend for success session about it this spring is essentially uh, looks like diving goggles that you put on and they're going to hit the market next year for just uh, around $300 and it's instead of looking at the screen you have peripheral view and head tracking so you're literally uh, inside the environment.
Great. Well, we're at the top of the hour. Thank you so much, AJ and team, uh, for sharing this with us. It's really interesting to uh, see how far you uh, come along. And while there are other medical simulations that are probably more sophisticated as far as the simulations themselves, um, I, I think this is about uh, the most uh, advanced simulation that anyone has, anyone has done as far as really focusing on teamwork and collaboration and figure out a way with the observation deck and the, the, the uh, patient avatar and uh, the, the whole um, format here of getting a, a doctor and medical assistants and nurses um, and re we didn't see that here but there it involves a receptionist uh, and seeing really everyone that's involved in an emergency getting them to work together and communicate with each other uh, properly, which is what's the key to any type of emergency like this. And uh, I think everyone can, here can see application to any other type of really teamwork skill building. So th thanks so much, and hope to see everyone back. We'll be at the uh, uh, regular uh, link, the Persephone link, uh, next week. Uh, we'll have a somewhat provocative speaker next week talking about. Uh, what's next uh, with uh, virtual words uh, and challenge um, challenge us all, uh, those of us who are uh, raving uh, uh, evangelists of, of virtual words, challenge our thinking a bit, so that should be interesting. Um, and we also have Steve Mahaley from Duke uh, uh, Corporate Education is going to uh, week after that. It's not up on the schedule yet, but it'll be up soon. It's going to uh, present a cool leadership, mobile leadership uh, app. And then we have TELUS later on as speaker. So we get, we're taking a break, of course, for Thanksgiving. But other than that, we'll meet every Thursday. So please come back at the same time.